It's been said that everybody's got a story to tell. Well, the person we're uh, about to meet tonight, there's no group of people in America more prepared to argue their constitutional rights. That's how we connect yeah. to yeah. each other. That's how we connect to yeah. our communities. And that's what we tried to do here yes. at the cafe. Well, welcome, Wayne. It's good to see you. And uh, how, does it feel? how does it feel to be back at uh, Hampton? It feels great. You know, I still live here. I live, I, I just live across the harbor in Suffolk, Virginia. So um, I live here and I'm, I commute. How do you commute? Uh, we have an apartment. No, uh, I mean, physically, do you drive or yeah, you take I the drive. train? It's, it's about, it's about three to four hours. Yeah, yeah. One of the things that I've learned down here, a hard lesson is, uh, I always thought that Hampton was like right outside of D.C. <laughs> it's about four Surprise. hours. Yes, yeah. Yeah. yes. Yeah. Well, why Manny Seller? Well, because he's, he's an amazing um, figure, an, an unsung hero. I became interested in him after writing, as you know, the biography of um, my mentor, Andy Cooper, who was a, a voting rights activist and journalism, uh, journalist. And, and Seller was, and, Seller was and, a, uh, Seller was Andy a- Andy Cooper was also a publisher of a, a black newspaper. Yes, In the city your Sun. home borough of it, Brooklyn. That's right. When I, and Manny Seller is from your home borough. He, right, and yeah. Manny Seller, I would consider he was anywhere from a supporting character to an extra in that book years ago. But prominently, there was a, an illustration of Bedford Stuyvesant, where I grew up, and it was carved up into parts of five other congressional districts. And Seller was from that piece, that little piece of Brooklyn. In fact, he may have actually been my congressman in my neighborhood, although I didn't know that at the time because I was a, I was a schoolboy. But I decided to look more into him, and I was intrigued by what he did with immigration reform. So that alone, when I, I pitched it to the publisher who published the Andy Cooper book, they said, go for it. But as I started doing the real work, I realized that he is and I can say this in a full-throated way, the godfather of civil rights legislation. Wow. So all the major civil rights legislation, we talk about the Civil Rights Act of 64, the Voting Rights Act. Wow. There was another um, civil rights act that was the Fair Housing Act. That, and, you know, as you know, as a, as a the journalist who was the last to cover Martin Luther King, um, Fair housing was passed days after King was assassinated. That, had, that bill had been bottled up for years. And in doing the research, I learned about the, the torturous route to that finally becoming a law, and Seller was a part of that. He had like a half century in the Congress, right? Yes, and, and here's the other interesting thing. He was two months shy of 50 years of service in Congress. And the reason why that happened was for us modern day people, we know that the new Congress comes back in January after an election. But he had been a congressman for so long, when he first became a congressman, the new Congress used to come back in March. So when he finally lost the election and had to leave, he was just two months shy of 50 years of service in the Congress. Wow. So he, he, he served from the days of Warren Harding, mm. all the way up to Richard Nixon. Mm. Ten, and I think it, it, was either, it was either eight or ten presidents that and he served Almost with. nowadays, whenever you hear his name, Emanuel Seller, it, it's in the context of how his career in the Congress ended, uh, which was by a young uh, woman. I think she was just 
in her early 20s, Elizabeth Holt. Yeah, she was, she was in her 20s, maybe just a little shy of 30, but, but either way you calculate it, she was young enough to be his granddaughter. Wow. And he, she toppled him. But how could a young, unknown woman, and at that time, mind you, there were not very many women uh, prominent in politics. Mm -hmm. How could she slay a lion mm -hmm. like the magnitude of Emanuel Seller? It's with cunning and hard work because one of the, 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 the most clever things she did was um, she would go to uh, constituents and say, look at this poor old man. He can barely hear now. Um, you know, you know. Instead of criticizing him, she kept saying, "You, you know, we, we, he needs to. It, it's time for him to rest." Mm. Um, and, and then, as she'd go to constituents, some of them were saying, "Yeah, you know, he, he's given us a lot of great service, but yeah, he, I think he can sit down now." <laughs> mm, mm, mm. Uh, but the uh, cellar was legend in Brooklyn. Uh, how how was it that she was able to uh, uh, be the one to characterize who he is? Didn't these people see him walking down the street every day? Well, no, that? because see, here's the thing. Uh, uh, as much as he was, he was so Brooklyn, but in his latter years, he was more a creature of Washington. I mean, he didn't even run a good local office. If, you know, many congressmen, um, one of the things they do well, even if they're not really of stature, is that they provide good constituent services. So they, they may have local offices. Um, oftentimes with a congressional district, you may have more than one congressional office to make sure constituents can come in if they, if they have concerns or problems. He really didn't do that. I mean, he's a legend because Often the time he was planted in Washington doing the hard work of getting laws passed and, and working with major problems. He kind of, he kind of, he, he neglected things, particularly in Brooklyn. In fact, his, uh, his main congressional office was in Manhattan. Oh, wow. So, and he was about big ideas and he did get things done, but one of the criticisms Holtzman used against him, he said, well, there are parts of his district that are just in shambles. Like, just go to Brownsville, or, oh, or, that was his... or ragged. Yeah, part part of Brownsville was in wow. his district. It was a sprawling district. So, and, and of course, like I said before, Bedford Stuyvesant being carved up. Bedford Stuyvesant was horrifically gerrymandered. So the the district kept flowing in and out. Some some of those congressmen had parts of Queens, or it might like jump over into a little part of Manhattan. You know, the, the district needed to be, Bedford-Stuyvesant needed its own compact district. When did Shirley Chisholm uh, come uh, rise to power in uh, Brooklyn? 1968, so it was the 1968 election. He was still in, he was Seller in was still in the Congress, but what happened, one of Seller's uh, neighbors, Edna Kelly, who was the first woman New York in, in the New York delegation, she was squeezed out wow. of, um, of Congress uh, because when they redraw that district, and that's when Shirley Chisholm ran for the seat in 1968 and won. Shirley Chisholm, probably more than uh, any other person, I'm, I'm speaking of uh, 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 black politicians, did not wait. She knew the imp understood that what the impact would be of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And by 1972, she was running for president. But here's my question, Wayne, to you. How is it that Emanuel Seller, co-author of the Voting Rights Act, and as you say in your book, how many civil rights, leg he was like the author of civil rights legislation, the first in 80 years, mm -hmm. and then many others. It would seem that he would be a legend among black people and revered for what he was able to accomplish. You know what, in Cong remember Major Congressman Major Owens? Yes. He famously said that in 
Congress, you have show horses, and you have workhorses. Seller was definitely a workhorse. Yes. I mean, he, yes. he was also the New York Times famously in that, that, that man, um, man in the News feature they would do. Right. When they did the man, when they spotlighted him, they nicknamed him the Congressional Bulldog because he was tenacious. He, he, was, he was funny right. and um, probably more friendly than he looked, but he seemed like a, just a grumpy old man, but he was also, he was a bulldog. He was tenacious. Even if he didn't get his way on something, he would be like that dog gnawing on your pants leg right. and not letting go. Right. So many of these battles for civil rights, for immigration reform, he fought for decades and often lost. Hmm. But he, he, he could carry something to the finish line eventually and, and not let it go. He was, if, if there was a, a more familiar people person who would be a great example, Ted Kennedy. Right. Even when Ted Kennedy was in the minority, um, his attitude was maybe I can't lead on this but I can get a piece of something for my people, for my constituents. So that was Seller. So, you know, he's just, I was just endlessly fascinated by him because he's someone who's just hiding in plain view. I, I also say that other books that have been written about uh, American politics or history in the last few years, um, writers cannot seriously write the book without at least referencing Seller a lot in their footnotes. Right. I but, mean, any serious, any serious history, I call it, I call the period, well, I don't call it, but I learned that the American century, when America was all powerful and dominant, was the period immediately after World War II for 30 years until the mid-1970s. That period is the American century. That is Sellers' era. That's, That's Sellers when he era. did his best work. Right. And there are 650,000 pieces of paper about him in the Library of Congress. Wow. I know because I've been there multiple times wow. to do research. Wow. Now, I didn't go through all 650,000 pieces of paper, but I went through a lot of it right. in order to write this book. So he was exactly what they said he was, yes. a workhorse. A workhorse, and, there's, and there is documentation to prove it. Yeah. It isn't and, just and talking. You, and when you look at it in that context that you lay out there, Wayne, as an old man, maybe his constituents were saying, well, he did his work. It is mm -hmm. time for him to go, and here comes a young woman. Uh, was she, after defeating Manuel Sellers, was she a celebrated uh, po politician in Brooklyn who kept moving up, or was she, there resentment that followed her for taking down? No, if anything, down? she was celebrated because now you had a young woman replacing Seller on the Judiciary Committee. He chaired the Judiciary Committee. Right. When you talk about accidents of history or oh, opportunities. Oh, she, was, she got that seat then on the judiciary? judiciary. So you had, which was pretty much usually just all white men. Right. So now, had Seller won, he would have been chairing the Watergate hearings. Wow. But it turns out it didn't happen that way. No, it was Peter Rodino. Who became, and Peter Rodino revered Seller. Yes, I, it, it, yes, I, I, it's what I notice in your book. Yes. yes, but okay, now you had this. And Elizabeth Holtzman made a big mark in the, well, she did in because the uh, once impeachment hearings. She was, at the, she was a, a voice on the impeachment hearings. She became known as a tenacious Nazi hunter. She, would, she was hunting people down. And, that, and you know, as you mentioned off camera, she went on to become um, um, the Brooklyn um, District Attorney, yes, among other yes, things. Yes, she may have been the first woman to uh, become a district attorney in New York. Probably, Yeah. probably. Wow, wow. Wait, here's another thing. This young woman takes down uh, uh, Manuel Seller. You, in your book, you uh, point out that Seller was known as an early advocate for women's rights in the Congress. 
Yes, I, and, and I couched it this way. He was very old timey. In fact, um, a writer at UP, United Press International called him the last Victorian because he was born in the 1880s. <laughs> he was, he, when he yeah. was born, the Brooklyn Bridge was just built, okay? Yeah. Yeah. If you had to go from Brooklyn to Manhattan, you had to row a boat over to the other side. But now there was the bridge. So, he, he, you know, he's from another era. Right. But he did, he was more respectful of women than his colleagues. But he still was very old-fashioned in his ways because of his age. So it was time for him to go because, you know, when Elizabeth Holtzman challenged him, it was at, like, the women's rights movement was now really big. Right. Um, there were other things going on. And he took a principled stand in which he was against the Equal Rights Amendment. It wasn't that he was well, anti-women, but he, he, he said... What was he, the uh, principled stand? Well, his, his argument, and you could be for it, or you could say, no, it's not a good argument. He said that you pass this Equal Rights Amendment, there are going to be unintended consequences that will actually hurt women. Mm. Keep in mind, you mentioned, you referenced Shirley Chisholm. Right. And one of the mind-blowing things about Shirley Chisholm when he ran, when she ran in 1972, and you had the filmmaker here for a previous cafe, it was mind-blowing to me that in 1972, a married woman had to get her husband's permission to get a credit card. Uh, that was yeah. in that documentary. Or yeah, if, yeah. A, if, a, if, a, if a woman wanted to get uh, car insurance then, oftentimes the auto insurance companies didn't want to grant it because they said, well, that's not really your car. That's, that's, that, that's the car you let your reckless boyfriend drive. <laughs> now, I'm, I'm describing things that in 2021 sound like I'm a crazy person, but it actually happened, yes, and I can find... Yes aunts and other elders who could verify that's what, she, what they went through. Right, right. So it was a different era, and here he is. It, it, he came off at that time in getting in the way of progress. A, a more colorful example, uh, in my research class at, at Morgan State, I would give a, a writing exercise where I have the two obituaries of Seller, New York Times and Washington Post, and I have the students write rewrite it into their, their own story. And one of my best students said, you know, Professor Dawkins, I was really feeling him on civil rights and all these other things he did, but women's rights, I wasn't feeling him at all. <laughs> and I just said, he was a man of his time. So yeah, he was, you could check the boxes, but on that one, it just caught up with him, you know? He was also a big critic of American immigration policy. Yes. And he tried to do something about it. Yes. What was his criticism and what was he able to do about it? Well, his criticism was, yes, he's from Brooklyn and he was from the Brooklyn at a time that was a borough of immigrants. Right. Pe you know, people of Irish descent, um, you know, Jewish, Italian. Um, it was before there were black Black folk were always in Brooklyn going all the way back to when the Dutch right, ran right. New York, but not in large numbers. That would come later. But he knew that he was from a multi, he, rep, he, he lived in a multi-ethnic community. And now in the early 1900s, there were the attempts to cut off immigration. And he resisted. Right. He, he, he resisted. Now, he and some fellow young congressman didn't win that fight. One of those fellow congressmen was Fiorello LaGuardia, who went on to become wow. the longtime mayor of New York City. Yes. Um, but he felt there was a need, we, we have to do something about immigration. You know, also when it became a refugee issue in World War II, word is getting back that Nazi Germany has a final solution. They are killing off Jewish people and other ethnics that they see are undesirable. He said, we have to do something about it. And then, then when World War II ended, we're now in a Cold War with um, what we now just call Russia, 
not, not the Soviet Union and, and China. And it was a case of, so because we only want certain people coming into the country, are we going to let these other folks come under the spell of our adversaries? So he raised, you know, this was, this was his battle. And he said, our immigration policy is racially discriminatory, OK? Hey. Because people of color from around the world were not even in the equation. So when the law was finally changed, the reform law, um, more than 50 years ago, in its simplest terms, it just says, look, if you want to come here legally, it will no longer matter whether you come from um, any part of Europe, Africa, Asia, Latin America. It, it doesn't matter anymore, rather than we only want certain kinds of Northern Europeans. Because right. that was our policy for 40 years, from the 1920s to the 1960s. Wow. And it was holding us, it, it, it was holding us back. It, was, it got to the point where post-World War II, it was a major headache for presidents. Truman, Eisenhower, Kennedy, and LBJ. And, and they recognized that something had to be done. How, how was it, I want to move over to the Civil Rights uh, era. Uh, he was able to uh, see the passage of a lot of legislation. Now, he is a Brooklyn person in charge of the, the leader in the Judiciary Committee. But so many of these committees in this era, his era, were Southern mm -hmm. Democrats and very much against civil rights. Oh, yeah. How was he able to succeed? How um, do you? This is where you need to be a workhorse and know the details. His main nemesis was um, Congressman Howard Judge Smith of Virginia, of um, Alexandria, Virginia, where I now have my, we have an apartment so I can com commute up to school in Baltimore. And he was a Democrat, but a, a rabid segregationist. His committee, since you mentioned committees, was the Rules Committee. The Rules Committee was often the place where bills would be like the baby he could strangle in the crib and kill. Right. And Seller, just being um, as determined and clever, was able several times to rescue the bill through parliamentary, uh, parliamentary procedures that they know in the Congress that right. us mere people don't know would make our heads spin. But um, and it, a few times he infuriated Howard Smith. But in the end, when Seller left and they were doing, um, you know, these appreciations of what he did, Howard Smith grudgingly said, yes, Emmanuel Seller does his homework. Mm. That, was, that was an adversary kind of just saying, yeah, he, he beat me a few times on Wayne, this. Wayne, take us through uh, uh, the litany of uh, civil rights uh, uh, initiatives that he saw through. Okay. And before I do that, the other thing, it, the seller had the gift of knowing how to work with people, even if he didn't agree with them or didn't even like them. Right. But okay. And, and the, that you're talking now mainly about these Southerners who were very much on a different uh, level. Yes, he had to. He, he, yeah, he had. To, but he had to work, work with, with them. Him. Yeah. And to get things done, you know, like right now in, in, what, in our current situation, what we're seeing with, as we speak, um, legislation in Congress. Um, an example, during the campaign, um, Joe Biden, you know, before when he was the presidential nominee, he got in trouble during the, one of the debates because he said back in the day when he was yeah. a congressman, he was able to get things passed working with people he didn't agree with who were set racial segregationists. But they got it done anyway. Yeah. Some, that was, but anyway. The, but, that, but that criticism against Biden came from Co Senator Booker, African American, and uh, Kamala they Harris. Knew, yes, Kamala Harris. And yes. Vice you know, and, and you know, they got past that. Yeah. But they, and you know what, as these two younger senators, 
you know, they may not say it, but they, they do have to work with people they don't agree with or even like. Right. To, but the idea is, are we going to get things done? And that's a debate we're having right now. And indeed, Seller did get things yes. done. Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. Now, could you run some of that Yeah, so the first, yeah. the, and, you know, for folks with basic, you know, understanding basic civics, no congressman or senator does it all by themselves because every law that gets passed has two sponsors. There's a, uh, a Senate sponsor and a House sponsor. But the, to just go through it quickly, 1957 was the first Civil Rights Act. It was the first in, in, in the 20th century. And there were many people, particularly in the NAACP and the civil rights community, that said, well, this doesn't do anything. But it did because it set up a civil rights commission. It created a way to document civil rights violations, especially in the South. They, it was followed up with another civil rights Act that was passed in 1960, and that put a little more foundation in it. So those first two acts actually set up the Civil Rights Act we all remember, which is the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Right. So, and, and in that one, I, I call that the, 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 the law that finally gave black people particularly first class citizenship rights. Didn't mean that racism and this uh, discrimination went away. No, it didn't, but at least under the law, we were full citizens with full rights, which we didn't have before 1964. Because we thought we did when, you know, after the Civil War, we had the, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment right. passed, but yeah. cleverly we were resegregated and we went through what, the nearly almost a century of Jim Crow. Yeah. Um, so now we had these laws on the book. And with that 1964 Civil Rights Act, um, amendments were added. Now this brings us back to the segregationist Congressman Howard Smith. He tried to kill the 64 Civil Rights Act by saying, oh, well, if we give black people their full citizenship rights, well, you're going to disenfranchise white women. Because, you know, the idea was, you know, women were not, did not have full rights. Right. I, I remember when Hillary Clint Clinton got in trouble as the first lady when she said, you know, actually American women are treated as property. A lot of people didn't like her speaking right. truthfully like that right. in, in 1992. But anyway, well, Seller and Smith got into a debate about that. And, and, and Seller, he kind of played this role as a kind of a, a hand-pecked husband, where he said um, the, the, the two most um, important words uh, you say in a household during an argument with your wife is, yes, dear. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but he kind of, it, he was using cunning, and yeah. in the end, the Civil Rights Act of 64 empowered more than just black people because there are all these amendments like Title, title IX and Title VI and all these different titles. Yes. These were now added to the act which ended discrimination based on gender, sex, religion, a whole bunch of things. Yes, yes. So that Civil Rights Act became even more inclusive. Yes. Um, we're at a college campus, so we, what often comes up in sports is Title IX. Title IX, yeah. That meant, Huge. you know, women can play sports too, and you need to start funding them equally. That's why over time, you know, I first started to see the Title IX of the Civil Rights Act go into effect in, um, my years in college in the early 70s, when finally I saw women playing varsity sports. Now, and I used to advise students here, um, there were some women athletes, they will dunk a basketball on you and step over you because <laughs> over time they have um, right. evolved and they are, yes. you know, they, yes. they are as skilled as the men, but yes. they, they needed to be given the opportunity. And we, you can thank, say thank you to Emmanuel Seller. Right. 
and and uh, the uh, which I call the the stunning one for me is that he was a co-author of the Voting Rights Act. Yes, and that that just uh, talk about that. Yes, and he he. You see, the thing about him chairing the Judiciary Committee, all these major bills had to go through that committee before it eventually ends up on the president's desk to sign into law. So he was just intimately involved in this stuff. And, and, and he, had, he was taking cues from the president. So whether it was the 64 Civil Rights Act or the Voting Rights Act, um, President Lyndon B. Johnson counted on Seller. I, I, I'm trying to remember whether it well, was. They, they were close. Oh, they were extremely close. And you know, because Johnson played a big role, he played a major role in getting the 1957 Civil Rights Act passed. That was cobbling together some compromises to give things to senators or congressmen in their districts where they agreed to sign on and pass that first Civil Rights Act. So what I remember, I don't know whether it's the Voting Rights Act or the Civil Rights Act. I think it's the Voting Rights Act. I think what happened was Lyndon B. Johnson gave a speech, a nationally televised speech, and at the end of his speech, he said, we shall overcome. Yeah. And, and historians have written, when Martin Luther King watched that and heard it, he wept. Yeah, he said, they're, they're actually going to do something. But that was stunning. That I was stunning. I remember that. That's, uh, uh, that and, was before and, a joint session of Congress? Yes, it was yeah. a joint session of Congress. And what happened afterwards, Seller walks up to the president, shakes his hand, says, that was a very good speech, Mr. President. Um, I'm going to, um, in, in a few days or so, I'm going to schedule hearings on the legislation. And LBJ looked at him and said, no, you are going to start it tonight. Wow. So that was a period, as you know, because wow. you covered it, there wow. was a sense of urgency. Yeah. If um, we don't move on this, it may never happen. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, there, there are so many parallels to now because, you know, what a number of people, okay, what President Biden is saying is that we are now at a defining moment in, you know, our, our history as a nation. And we have to do some things big or else. We are, um, you know, one of the things, uh, you know, just to stray a little bit, I learned in writing this book is that reading other historians, it looks like it often takes at least 20 years into a new century for the new century to kick in for real. And here we are, we're in 2021. So we have shaken, we have really shaken off the 1900s. Right. I mean, right. if we want to talk about type, manual typewriters and rotary telephones and other stuff and make young people roll their eyes at us and wonder what we're talking about, yeah, that was then. We're into some, yeah. all this new stuff around us now. <laughs> yes. And we need to get with the program. Yeah. And there's some big things going on in this country and the world, and it's time to deal with it. Wayne Dawkins, it's great to have you here today, Wayne. Uh, you have a lot of Manny uh, Seller in you, too. You're not a show horse, you're a workhorse. But you're always, well, thank working, you. I own that. You're always working on another book. What, what do you, what's in the hopper for you next? Oh, man. I just got a reminder yesterday. Um, I'm supposed to be writing, agreeing to write a dual biography of black sports writers Sam Lacey and Wendell Smith. Ooh. Sam Lacey of the Afro-American of Baltimore and Wendell Smith Pittsburgh of the Pittsburgh Courier, Courier your I'm a, hometown paper. I'm a paper. Pennsylvania boy and I was yeah. in my young days. Uh, he was one of, the, one of my great heroes because he would have the, all the stories about Jackie Robinson and all of that. And they made a character for him in the movie. And I was stunned that in that movie they showed him working from a seat in the in the uh, because in the it's because of segregation, the sports writers would not allow him into the press box. Wow. 
I hope you'll come back and Brett, tell us about that story. Yeah, that's, I just got to get it done now. Well, it's a, that, that's a big one, but it yeah. sure is a good one. Wayne, thanks. It's been wonderful. Appreciate your coming. Mm -hmm. And this is your, it's not your first time here at the Caldwell Cafe. No, it As a matter of fact, we miss you mightily because when you were here, you were one of the foundation people in that workhorse. <laughs> thank you so well, thank much, you. Wayne. Thanks, thanks for inviting me. Okay, that's it for this time in the Caldwell Cafe. Until next time, I'm Earl Caldwell. <laughs>